What's your response to these two words, public speaking? Now, for some of you, I know there's a thrill, there's an enthusiasm, there's an invigoration that comes when you just think about giving a public speech, a presentation of some sort, and you're eager to give one. In fact, you wouldn't mind if I keeled over and you got to take over. That's how you think about public speaking. Now, my guess is there are some of you in this room for whom the reaction is just as strong, but not quite as positive. Am I right? Uh, there are some, and heads are nodding. There are some of you that approach public speaking. It's not that you hate it so much. It's just it seems difficult. It seems hard. It seems like it takes more effort than it really should, and the payoff just isn't there, and you tend to avoid public speaking. Then there are others of you I know who have a much more, a much stronger distaste of public speaking. It's not just that you want to kind of avoid it, you want to avoid it at all costs. You don't want to have anything to do with public speaking. In fact, I would go so far as to say if I offered you two options, some of you would select the option of licking burlap for 30 minutes before you'd select the option of speaking to an audience for 30 minutes. Am I right? right. You may have heard about a study that was done a number of years ago that asked Americans what they fear and they ranked their fears. The number one fear in that study was public speaking, giving a speech. Spiders, snakes, death, all those things ranked lower on the list than giving a public presentation. And some of you are not, and you may have participated in that study, and you may have put public speaking number one on your list. Why is that? Well, when it comes to public speaking, giving presentations, sales presentations, training programs, one-on-one -on -one presentations, we all tend to experience some degree of apprehension, and some of us experience levels of fear. Fear is not necessarily a good thing. In fact, I've heard it said that fear is the dark room where we develop the negatives of our lives. And I don't want that to be the case for you when it comes to public speaking or giving any kind of presentation. And so in this session, we're going to focus on things that you can do to help reduce that anxiety, hopefully to eliminate some of the fear and then take whatever anxiety or nervousness is left and use it to your advantage. To do that, we're going to focus on several different things. We're going to look first at where you are when it comes to your response to public speaking. How do you respond? And then we're going to ask the question, how do you want to respond? What would you prefer that your response be? Basically, we're going to set a goal first thing this morning. Following that, we're going to take a look at mental anxiety. What kinds of things are you thinking and are you telling yourself that creates anxiety and how can you control that? And then we'll tackle the tough one physical anxiety, you know, the quakes and the shivers and the sweating and all of that. We're going to look at that and see what kinds of things happen to you, how could you respond to those, or even better, how could you eliminate some of those things. So that when you stand up to give your next presentation, fear isn't a factor in that presentation. It won't be something that you have to deal with. So that's what we're going to focus on in this session. I train public speakers on a regular basis, people who talk for a living. They get paid to speak. And here's the news you need to know. They all get nervous. They all have some degree of anxiety. So starting out right now, you need to feel okay about the fact if you experience anxiety, that's okay. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that's a really good thing. I'm glad you're experiencing that level of anxiety. And we'll talk in a moment about how to use that to your advantage. The first thing we need to look at is where are you when it comes to public speaking? How do you feel about it? How do you respond to the idea of giving a public presentation? And as we work through this, we're not just talking about a formal presentation where you're standing behind a podium delivering an address to 100 people. We're talking about any kind of presentation. Maybe it's one-on-one -on -one across a desk making a proposal to your supervisor. Uh, maybe it's a sales presentation to a group of people. Maybe you're facilitating a team meeting. That's a presentation. And maybe then it is a formal address to 50 people or 500 people. Any kind of presentation can create some kind of fear, some kind of anxiety. Bert Decker is a communication expert. He manages and works with and consults with people who speak for a living and people who never ever anticipate speaking for a living but have to give a speech. And here's what he and his staff have discovered. When it comes to public presentations, there are basically four categories of responses that we can have to public presentation assignments. My guess is, my hope is, you fall into one of these four categories. As I share them with you, decide which one is yours. Decide which one you fit into, and then we'll look at that in a little more detail. The first category is beginners. That's the title he uses. Beginners represent about 30% of society. Beginners are the people who, when they're given a public speaking assignment or asked to facilitate a team meeting, their emotional reaction is terror. Not just, I'm a little bit worried, but sheer debilitating terror. And they avoid public speaking at all costs. That's about 30% of our society. The next level, if you're not in that level, you might be in the next level, which is called the basic presenters. This is the biggest category. This is 50% of society. 50% of the people fall into the category Bert Decker calls basic. And their reaction to the option of public speaking isn't as strong as terror, but it is still an element of fear. 
these aren't people who would rather do anything than public speak. They're people who, if persuaded, if sold on the idea, might come around and be willing to give a public presentation, though they'll resent having to do it. You may be in that category. Then there's the next category up, representing about 15% of society. And this category, Bert Decker calls advanced public speakers. These are the people who they don't experience terror, they don't experience fear, but they do experience tension when it comes to public speaking. Maybe that's you. You don't just outright get scared, but you're a little tense before you go on to speak. That's about 15% of society. And then there's the final category. Hopefully someone in this room is in this category. 5% of society is in the very top category, which Bert Decker labels professional speakers. Not necessarily getting paid, but that's the category he uses, professional speakers. And these are the people, when they're given a public speaking assignment or asked to give a sales presentation, they are eager, they're willing, they're exciting, and they experience a degree of stimulation with the idea of giving a public presentation. Now, having heard those four categories, beginners, basics, advanced, and professional, do you know where you are? Can you identify which one you're in? There's some big smiles because you know right where you are. You didn't have to think about it for very long. Here's what you do next. You set a goal to move up one level, just one level. It's not realistic to say, I'm in the beginner category and I want to be an advanced speaker next. That's not how you set goals. So as we process through this presentation and this session, think in terms of moving up one goal. If you're a basic level right now, focus on being on the advanced level. If you're a beginner, focus on being on the basic level. That's the appropriate way to set a realistic goal for where you want to be. If you start out saying, I'm going to change 180 degrees, it won't happen for you. So make a realistic goal. Once you have that goal in mind, let's talk about how you get from A to B. You're at point A now, you want to get to point B. The first thing to focus on is your mental anxiety. When you are assigned to give a presentation, when someone comes into your offices and say, says, hey, I'd love to have you speak on this, or you get the phone call and the person does a little chit-chat and you know something's coming and finally they get around to the point, you need to make a speech, or they say something similar. What happens to you at that moment? What are you saying to yourself? Some of you are saying things like, why me? Why isn't Joanne doing it? She's the person who ought to be giving this presentation. Why isn't Jim doing it? Jim gives great presentations. Why me? And you're thinking of reasons how you can get out of it before you're even into it. Does that happen to you from time to time? Then what happens? For whatever reason, either you agree or you're persuaded or you're threatened, you agree to give the presentation. And you say yes. You may say yes, but you say yes. The next thing you do is you go out and you're doing your research and you're writing your presentation. What are you saying to yourself while you're working on that? Some people are saying things like, I really wish I hadn't gotten into this. Why? This isn't very good material. I can't believe I'm actually spending time on this. I'll never get to the point where it's going to be good. Constantly telling ourselves that same message. So you get past that point, now you're practicing. Because you're a good speaker, so you practice. So you're practicing your presentation. And what's happening while you're practicing? What are you saying to yourself while other words are coming out of your mouth? This isn't very good. I wish I had more time. This isn't, this isn't what they were looking for. Joanne's really the person who should be doing this. You're continuing that message. Now, it's just before you give the presentation. You're sitting in the front row, and the person's introducing you, saying wonderful things you didn't even know about yourself. You're about to go on, and what are you saying to yourself at that moment? I can't believe I'm here. I hope I don't forget. I, just, I hope it goes at least as well as I practiced it. I hope that so-and-so didn't show up today because he was supposed to be here. I don't want him to see what's about to happen. You're saying those things to yourself, and then your name is called. And you go to the front of the room, or you sit, go to the head of the meeting table, or you get it invited into the office. You spread your notes out on the podium. You look down for a moment. And what are you thinking to yourself just as you look up to the audience? Here goes. And that's all the hope you give yourself. Is that true? I'm seeing heads nod. I'm guessing that's happened to you. All of those things are clearly negative thinking. They're, they're negative thoughts. You're telling yourself it won't work. I'm the wrong guy for the job. I'm the wrong woman for the job. Somebody else should be doing it. You're reinforcing it's not going to go well. That's negative thinking. We'll come back to that in a moment. There's another type of thinking I want to identify in case you've ever been a victim of this. I'll call it faulty thinking. Faulty thinking happens when you tell yourself something that's not true. Here's an example. Have you been to a presentation or maybe been around a team meeting and someone's facilitating a discussion or maybe it's a formal presentation and you look at that person and you say, wow, I, I wish I could do that. That person's in control. He's prepared. She knows what she's saying. She's clearly not nervous. It's, I wish I could do that because she's got it all together. She's not even nervous. That's faulty thinking. Do you know why? That person's nervous. Have you ever seen Barbara Streisand sing? You would assume, or act in a movie, you would assume she's got it all together. But in reality, she professes to stage fright. But you don't see that. But she's a professional performer. 
the best speakers that you've been to see or maybe you've listened to on audio tape, guaranteed there's a degree of apprehension there. Faulty thinking says, they don't get nervous, I do. Therefore, I have this issue. If you're guilty of faulty thinking or if you're guilty of negative thinking, it's time to remove those thoughts. And here's how you do it. You replace those thoughts with what we'll call realistic thinking. Realistic thinking is this. You take a look at fear that you're experiencing. You say, what's the deal here? Why is this the case? I mean, think about it. You're going to stand in front of a group of nice, smiling people, much like we have here today. What are you afraid of? I'll tell you what you're afraid of. If you're anything like me, it's a fear of the unknown. What's going to happen? I know I'm going to open my mouth, but beyond that point, I'm not really clear on what the outcome's going to be. So there's a fear, basically, of the unknown. You don't know what lies ahead. I've heard fear described as false evidence appearing real. The letters of fear spell out false evidence appearing real. It seems like it's a really big deal. It seems like it's strong evidence saying it's not going to work. You're the wrong person. It appears real because you're telling yourself that. Realistic thinking says that doesn't make sense. That's not how it really is. Here's another problem with this equation. When we get nervous, when we get afraid, our body kicks in to help out. And you know what happens? It starts the adrenaline flowing to help out with this nervousness or this fear. And when the adrenaline starts flowing, you know what happens next? Energy. Incredible amounts of energy come from that extra adrenaline that's flowing. Now, that's, that's a good thing. And your body's doing that for a good reason. Because when you're nervous, when you're afraid, your body ex tells you you've got two options. You know what they are? Fight or flight. It says, either run as fast as you can, here's the energy you need to do it, or find somebody and duke it out, here's the energy you need to do that. Those are the options your body gives you. So let's think about it then. You're going to give a presentation. You're going to stand in front of a nice group of smiling people who are nodding their heads and being friendly and all of that, and your body's saying, either run for your life or fight somebody. Well, which of those options are you going to choose? You don't get those options. And as a result, you have all this energy that has to go somewhere. It's not going down the hall, and it's not going to pick somebody up by the shirt collars and fight them. So you have to do something with it. We're going to look at that a little more in depth when we talk about physical anxiety. But let's talk first about some additional things you can do to reduce that amount of adrenaline, reduce that amount of energy, so that it gets to manageable levels. There are several things you can do to reduce your energy, your nervousness, to a manageable, manageable level. Here is one thing I would suggest. I'll call it mental gymnastics. This is how you use realistic thinking to replace faulty and negative thinking. Have you heard of the book called I Can See You Naked? It's a very popular book on the subject of public speaking. And you can guess by the title what it would suggest you do to reduce your nervousness. Two points. One, I'm not doing that now. And two, I'm not sure that's great advice because if you're, if you're anything like me, that could be a little bit disconcerting or distracting. So I don't do that. But here's a variation on that kind of mental gymnastics. When you look out at your audience, pretend that everyone in the audience has on a great, big, funny, brightly colored hat. And look at your audience in that way. That will help reduce some nervousness. Or here's another one. When you look at your audience, assume nobody has heads on their shoulders. They have cabbages on their shoulders. Everybody in the audience has a cabbage for a head. Now, you can't do that for your entire presentation because you can't give a powerful presentation to a room of cabbages. So you do that at the beginning just to reduce the mental nervousness, mental gymnastics. Here's another variation from a speaker, Dorothy Sarnoff. She consults with public figures who do a lot of speaking and do a lot of presentations. Here are the mental gymnastics that she suggests. There's a four-part statement that you tell yourself before you go on to give a presentation. Here are the parts. You say this to yourself. I'm glad I'm here. Boy, that's a toughie. I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad you're here with reference to your audience. I care about you with reference to your audience. And I know what I know. Now, those are the four statements that you say just before you go on for a presentation. Here's why. When you say to yourself, I'm glad I'm here, you know what you've done? You've created it to be a good thing that you're here, not a bad thing. I'm glad. If you say I'm glad, it's, it's for good reason. So I'm glad I'm here. You begin that positive thinking. And when you say to yourself, I'm glad you're here, with reference to the audience, you're saying they're not the enemy. <laughs> they're not the thing out there I have to deal with before I get to leave. It's a good thing to have my audience here. I'm glad they're here. They're going to be a part of this good experience for me. And then when you say to yourself, I care about you, you're saying it's not me that I'm in here for. The focus isn't here, the focus is there. If you care about your audience, you can't be worried about what your next word's going to be or will you remember what you prepared. I care about you. And if you say that, you'll demonstrate it. You'll be a more powerful presenter. And finally, when you say to yourself, I know what I know, you're saying, I'm the right guy for the job. I'm the person who should be at the front of the room. I know the things that I have prepared. I've done more preparation for this than anyone in the room. I'm credible and I deserve to be here. Imagine how that thinking compares to, oh, I wish I didn't have to do this. Do you see the difference? So use mental gymnastics to replace faulty and negative thinking with realistic thinking. 
two other things that you can do to improve or reduce mental anxiety. One we'll call directed focus. Directed focus is where just before you go on for your presentation, you find something in the room that you can focus on other than you and your notes. For instance, in this room, perhaps it's this tree. And you're about to go on. Let's say you're coming on to give a presentation when I'm finished. And you're sitting in the front row, and you're thinking about your presentation and your notes, and you're worried, and you're thinking about it. Instead of that, focus on that tree. Examine that tree. Look at the pot that it's in. Look at the trunk that it's made of. Look at the leaves on that tree. Who knows? Maybe you should count the leaves. That could take you a while. Examine the tree. Think about where that tree's been, where that tree's going. Focus on that tree. Now, the tree's irrelevant. You can focus on whatever you want to focus on. The key is you're not focusing on yourself, and you're not focusing on your notes and what's going to happen. You're focusing on something totally unrelated. Now, that's before you give your presentation. If during your presentation you're still focused on the tree, things won't work out well for you. So that only happens just before your presentation. There's one other thing that I think you need to do to help minimize this mental apprehension. It's two words. Visualize success. Visualize yourself as successful from the very beginning. The moment you get that call and the person says, would you mind giving a presentation on, instantly visualize how wonderful it's going to be. See it as working. See your audience. See them smiling. See them nodding. See them agreeing. See them appreciating the information you're giving. The moment you get that assignment, you don't even know what you're going to say yet, but you can see the audience. Here's the news. I've seen you before. I saw you when I was first asked to give this presentation. I already had seen you, and I saw you smiling and nodding. Then all the way through your preparation and your practice, continue seeing your audience. When you're doing your research and you come across a great story, visualize yourself telling that story to the audience and visualize their response. Maybe they'll laugh, maybe they'll nod, maybe they'll take a note, but visualize that happening. Just before you give your presentation, do the exact same thing. You've seen the audience at that point probably. Visualize them with an incredibly positive response. I feel like I know you all well and I haven't even had much time to spend with you because I've seen you for weeks now. Smiling, nodding, encouraging me, and it's a powerful, powerful thing to help reduce your apprehension, reduce your nervousness. So these are some ways you can get your mental anxiety under control. And I wish that were the end, but it's not. Have you seen a speaker? who for whatever reason something happens to him or her that wasn't part of the script, like sweating, perspiring, shaking. There was a movie a number of years ago about some broadcast journalists, and there was one gentleman who was always out in the field, and he was doing reports out in the field. He wanted to be behind the desk. He wanted to anchor one night, and he finally got the big opportunity. And when he got behind the desk, he was pretty nervous. He was experiencing some nervousness. But it wasn't anything all that visible until the lights came up and the camera turned on, and then it happened. His perspiration started showing around his collar, and for the sake of comedy in the movie, it came out everywhere else. It was all over him because of how nervous he was under that circumstance. Those kinds of things tend to happen. First step, know what happens to you. What typically happens when you get nervous? Does anybody in here uh, shake when you get nervous? Knees knock? Okay, we've got a couple who are willing to admit it. Yeah, there's another. So sometimes it's that shakiness. Does anybody get out of breath when you speak? Yeah, there's a head. You wish you could just say, okay, hold a moment, and then go on again so you can get a deep breath, right? You get a little bit out of breath. Or dry mouth. Sometimes people get dry mouth and you hear that clicking noise while they're giving a presentation. It's just nervousness making itself known. I had the opportunity to teach at a major university for a while, and I taught communication skills, speech giving. And I remember clearly one student, because the first speech of the semester, she got up to give her speech or her presentation, and she didn't look all that nervous. She stood up. She was prepared. And she got ready to speak, and as she did, red blotches showed up on her neck. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. She didn't obviously know. She wasn't paying any attention, but they grew. And in her five-minute presentation, they grew up to about halfway through her face. When she was finished, she was two-tone, clearly two-tone. It was just the nervousness, the anxiety, the fear making itself manifest physically. The first thing we need to do is decide what happens to you. Know in advance what typically happens. And if you can't remember what that is, just give a five-minute presentation as you leave here, and someone will tell you clearly what it is that happens to you. Once you know that, then the next thing you do is say, is there anything that I could do when I'm experiencing that that could minimize it on the spot or reduce the effects of it? For example, if you get dry mouth, just have a cup of water nearby. If you're going to facilitate a meeting and you're a little bit nervous about it, have a cup of water. We would much rather see you take a drink than experience that whole clicking noise for the whole meeting. If you have a tendency to uh, shake a little bit when you give a presentation, know how to reduce that uh, by using your hands differently. For example, when I uh, give presentations, I do a lot of training, and I get involved with the audience, and sometimes that gets me really emotionally involved, and sometimes my hands tend to quiver. That's the thing that I've identified on this list. In teaching, I often use an overhead projector, so I'll have a projector here, and it will be projecting an image up here. 
And you know, you work with the glass. So I'm pointing to something on the glass. Now in this finger, it's just doing this little bit of quiver down here. It's just like this. You know what's happening up there? It's waving at the audience because it's huge. And so one thing you might say is, well, use a pointer. OK, you use a pointer. What happens? It's exaggerated. It's bigger here, which makes it bigger up there. So instead of that, when I feel that effect coming on, I don't quit using transparencies. I don't quit pointing to things. I press my finger right onto the glass. I push it hard onto the glass so that it can't possibly shake. The audience doesn't know the difference, but up there, there's a steady finger pointing to whatever that item is. So I just know that's what I need to do in response. If you tend to perspire profusely, please, we would much rather see you take out a handkerchief and wipe your brow than to continue that process for an entire meeting or an entire presentation. So if there's something you can do that you can prepare for in advance, plan on that. Make, give yourself that advantage. Have that thing to work uh, in your favor. It'd be nice to say, for everything that might happen, there is something you could do, like have a handkerchief or have a glass of water. You and I know that's not the case. So let's look at some things that you can do in a more global sense, some things you can do to help minimize the effects that the physical anxiety has on your body. Here are, are a couple of things that you can think about. Number one, relax. Well, that's easy for me to say. Just relax and you'll be a better speaker. That's not the whole picture, obviously. There are some things you need to do to help yourself relax. Here are some things you can try. And I would suggest you do this with me. The first one's called progressive relaxation. What you need to do is sit, even, sit in your chair with your feet evenly on the floor, legs uncrossed. Put your hands on your thighs with your fingers spread a comfortable distance apart. If you want to close your eyes, that's fine, but you don't need to. And follow through this process with me. First thing, curl your toes inside your shoes. Now tighten the muscles of your feet. Keep all that tight and tighten your calf muscles. Now you're tight below the knees. Now tighten your thighs, tighten your legs. Keep everything tight, tighten your seat muscles. Everything is now tight below the waist. Tighten your abdomen. Tighten the small of your back. Everything's getting tight way down. Tighten your chest muscles, tighten across your back. Now work it on up, everything's tight below the neck. Now tighten your neck muscles. Now bring it up to your face. Tighten your face muscles. You have to grimace if you do it right. Some of you are doing a great job. Grimace. Now hold it. Now slowly let go of just your face. Just your face. Everything below the neck is still tight. Now re release your neck muscles below the chest. Everything's still tight. Release the muscles across your shoulders and your back and your chest. And now release the small of your back and your abdomen. Below the waist, it's all still tight. Now release your seat muscles. Working slowly down the legs, release your thighs. Let go of the tension in your calves. Your feet are still tight. Let go of the muscles of your feet and now uncurl your toes. Whew. How do you feel? Are you relaxed? You look very relaxed. So wake up because we're going to try something else. You can do that even before you go on to give a presentation. Now, if you're on a podium or on a stage and your name's about to be called, don't grimace. That, that'll give you away. So you can do everything but the grimace. Here's something else you can do that's a little more discreet. This is another type of relaxation called the one-minute countdown. Again, if you want to, close your eyes, but you don't necessarily need to. Sit in a comfortable way. And take in a deep breath for six seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hold it. Two, three, four, five, six. Let it out slowly. Two, three, four, five, six. If you did that three times in a row, you'd have a minute's worth of relaxation. Isn't that easy? Does it feel good? Now, there's variations you can do with that. Let's do it again, only this time, as you take in the breath, imagine a great big fat number one coming up over the horizon. And then when you hold the breath, hold it up there, and then when you let the breath go, let it slide down. Let's do it again. Take a deep breath and see the number one coming up over the horizon. Two, three, four, five, six. Hold the one in the sky. Three, four, five, six. Let it go down slowly. Two, three, four, five, six. Three times in a row, and you've got a minute's worth of relaxation. And no one knew you did it. I, had, I saw no effects of that whatsoever. There's variations on that. You can do the number one going up and down. You can imagine a scene that goes from red hues to blue hues and back to red. That would work. Or you can imagine an icicle forming and crystallizing as you hold your breath and then melting as you're letting your breath out. Seems a little bit ridiculous, but it does wonderful things for you to relax. Just relax a little bit. So there's some ideas on how to relax. Now, that's one thing to say, just relax. There's some other elements we need to look at. Here's the second tip. Again, this one's easier for me to say than for you to do. I recognize that. Breathe. You know what that'll do for your presentations? Now, for some of you, that's the whole tip. Please, breathe. Just start breathing. For others of you, once you've accomplished that thing and you're, you're truly breathing, now the next step is breathe correctly. In order to breathe correctly, here's what needs to happen. Your diaphragm needs to move. This is not a correct breath. <gasps> You see the shoulders move? You can't get a deep breath when you do that. If you do that for an entire presentation, you're essentially breathing from the neck up. You can't possibly get enough air to produce an entire presentation. To breathe correctly, your stomach muscles will move. If you take a deep breath in, you can see your stomach change. It goes out, and it comes back in. 
Now, if you're having trouble making this happen, one thing you can do is pretend that something has shocked you. Because when you gasp, <gasps> it happens. You breathe correctly. Your stomach goes out when you gasp if you've been scared. If that's not working for you, here's one other thing to try. Not here, not now, but some other time. Go home, maybe. Lie down on the floor and put a book on your stomach. And watch what happens to the book. Because when you're lying on your back, it's almost impossible to breathe incorrectly. You almost have to breathe correctly. And that'll at least give you the sensation of what it feels like. So breathe. You need to relax and you need to breathe. There are two other things.